بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيد محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته This is the second session of our class entitled The Basics of the World Religions Inshallah Ta'ala uh, Today we're going to um, talk about the religion of Islam. We're going to finish our discussion on the religion of Islam, inshallah ta'ala, and then we're going to uh, move uh, next week into Judaism, inshallah ta'ala. So last week, we began reading the um, famous hadith, Jibril alayhi salam, the tradition of Gabriel, peace be upon him. And we covered most of the hadith, just to give you a quick recap. We said that Gabriel, peace be upon him, the archangel, incarnated, basically, um, uh, became a man and uh, came to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam in the presence of the companions or some of the companions and uh, sat in front of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and asked him a series of questions, asked him about al-Islam, which of course is the name of the religion itself, but we said that in the context of this hadith, it seems to be a reference to the exterior uh, element uh, of the religion, that which has to do with the body. Um, and then the Prophet ﷺ answered the question by, uh, by uh, explaining or listing the five pillars uh, of Islam. And then Jibreel ﷺ asked the Prophet ﷺ a second question about al-Iman, what is faith. And the Prophet ﷺ, he um, described the six articles of faith. And that's where we left off. Qala sadaqta. Then Jibreel alayhi salam, he says to the Prophet وسلم, you have spoken the truth. Qala fa'akhbirni anil ihsan. So now we continue the hadith, the famous hadith. And there's a third question that Jibreel alayhi salam asks the Prophet وسلم, what is al ihsan? Right? And the, the root word uh, here is beauty. Uh, ihsan is translated in a number of ways. Spiritual excellence is one way of translating it. So we said that al-Islam is uh, a reference to sort of the horizontal aspect of the religion, while iman is a reference to the vertical aspect of religion, or that which has to do with the uh, body and the mind. And finally, we have ihsan, the transcendental aspect of the religion, or the relational aspect or you can say uh, the soul of the religion itself. Um, Al-Ihsan, uh, a technical term for Al-Ihsan is uh, tasawwuf. Um, according to many of the ulama, they are, uh, it's, it's, the same, uh, it's the same thing. They're, they're synonymous, sometimes called Sufism. But when we talk about Sufism, we're talking about Sufism in the context of both Islam and Iman, right? Uh, we're talking about spirituality um, with a cognizance that the true, that a true spirituality from the context of our religion is grounded in Islam uh, as well as Iman. So tasawwuf is just a, a technical term for al-ihsan, right? Um, the aim, if you will, or the the <clears throat> the sort of if we use Aristotelian nomenclature, the, the, the final cause of the human being uh, in the Islamic tradition is uh, to actualize wilaya, right, or friendship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, to make oneself beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the aim of al-ihsan, of Islamic spirituality and different Muslim metaphysicians and scholars, they describe the process. Imam Ghazali, for example, who writes about tasawwuf amali, uh, a practical Sufism, if you will. Uh, he recommends that Muslims must sit with uh, scholars. They must sit with the spiritual masters and take from their prescriptions, take from their uh, avkar, take from their different litanies and eulogies and remembrances of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala one of, the, one of the great scholars, Ahmad Zarouq, he said that if you don't have a spiritual master, 
then take a salah ala nabi as your spiritual master. Take the benedictions upon the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, as your spiritual master, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guide you spiritually by means of the salah ala nabi because the Prophet وسلم, was the greatest of spiritual masters. So um, Imam al-Ghazali, he talks about you know, this sort of three-step process of, um, of purging, uh, if you will, the, the lower self, the nafs of vice, right? Um, this is called a kenosis in Greek or catharsis uh, via purgativa in the Catholic tradition. Uh, to purge oneself, to get rid of these vices, right? What are, the, what are some of these vices? What are the vices? These are diseases of the heart, the amrad al The major ones are kibr, like arrogance, and hasad, envy, riya, right, uh, ostentation. So disciplining the lower self, emptying the self of these, of these vices, but also then ornamenting the self uh, with virtue. This is, uh, so the first one he calls takhliya. This one he calls tahliya, right? To ornament the self, to, to take on virtue. And of course, we know the cardinal virtues um, uh, of, you know, adala and shuja'a and hikmah, ifa. But you also have these theological virtues. And Imam al Ghazali, he enumerates 19 or 21 theological virtues like tawbah, like sabr, like repentance, like, like patience. Um, uh, raja, hope, so on and so forth. And then finally you have something called tajliya, right? This is to sort of manifest the divine ethos at a human level, right? This is when the abd becomes a wali, if you will, a friend of God, because he mirrors the divine attributes, the divine names and attributes at a level, at the level of a human being, Right? So the perfect mirror, if you will, at a, at a human level of God's names and attributes was the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran intimates this when he calls the Prophet by two of his own names. لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِمَا عَنِتُمْ حَرِيسٌ عَلَيْكُمْ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَؤُوفُ الرَّحِيمِ Right? That the Prophet Wasallam, there has come unto you a messenger from among yourselves it grieves him that you should perish. Deeply concerned is he about you to the believers. He is kind and merciful. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ar-ra'uf and ar-rahim with the definite article. Right? In this sort of absolute sense, in a sense that is beyond human capability, beyond human comprehension. But something of that attribute, right, is reflected in the character, the beautiful character of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi alayhi wa sallam. And he said in a hadith, and there's weakness in the hadith, but it's true in its meaning, تَخَلَّقُوا بِأَخْلَاقِ الله, That to adorn yourself with the character, if you will, of God. Right? And the Prophet ﷺ is mentioned in the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to him directly in the Qur'an. وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ Verily, verily, you dominate. Right? عَلَى خُلُق عَلَى is usually used in grammar to denote something physical, like upon the desk or upon the floor, something like that, upon the roof. But if there's um, an abstract noun that follows ala, then this den denotes a type of mastery or tamakkun. So indeed, you have mastered khuluq uh, azim, a great character, magnificent character, because he is a reflection of the divine names and attributes at the human level, right? So like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Speaking to the Prophet in the Quran, Rama Rameta Id Rameta, Allaha Rama. You did not throw when you threw. Allah threw, right? Before the Battle of Badr, you know the famous story. The Prophet وسلم, he picks up some pebbles and he throws them into the direction of the Mushrikeen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to him, You did not throw when you threw. Right? Very interesting. But Allah threw. What does this mean? Does this mean that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala incarnated into the Prophet sallallahu and undertook this action. That's not what it means. It means that all of the actions of the Prophet sallallahu however mundane they might seem, all of them are guided 
by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? He is a sanctified agent of the divine. And this is the goal for all of us. Obviously, we cannot attain the maqamat of, of the prophets, but we can attain, we cannot be prophets, we cannot attain nabuwa, but we can attain wilaya, right? We can become from the awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet sallallahu he intimates this in another hadith, which is in Bukhari, which is hadith number 41 of the Arba'in. Arba'in means 40, but Imam al-Nawawi included two more hadith, right? Uh, where hadith number 41, where he reports from the Prophet, where the Prophet sallallahu is reported to have said, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يكون هواه تبعا لما جئت به. None of you truly believe until his hawa, his hawa is his desires, his caprice, his hawa is in perfect accordance with what I have brought. And what did the Prophet ﷺ bring? He brought the Quran and his ethos, the Sunnah. In other words, he brought al huda, he brought the guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And that is perfect, that's perfect iman. That's, that's an actualized type of, of, of faith, is that your desires and wants are perfectly aligned with what Allah and his messenger wants. This is a definition, if you will, of wilaya. Reminds me of something Confucius says in the Analects, the Lun Yu, where he says, at, at 50 years old, I understood the mandate of heaven and at 70 years old, um, he says, um, at 70 years old, I followed my heart's desire without overstepping the line, right? So he's describing this type of wilaya. And Confucius did believe in God. And um, the jury is out whether, I mean, he certainly could have been a prophet. There's a good case to make, I think, being Confucius, wallahu alam just as there's a good case to be made for Siddhartha Gautama or the Buddha um, being a khidr mentioned in the Quran, wallahu alam. So this is, this is, in other words, this is mystical union, right? When your desires align with the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the term for that is mystical union. Um, and... Uh, uh, there's other hadith that intimate this, this phenomenon. Hadith number 38, for example, in the Arba'in, also from Bukhari, where the Prophet وسلم, he's reported to have said, let me uh, look at that really quickly here. So this is a hadith Qudsi, this is a sacred hadith, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will speak in the first person. So an Abi Hurairah radiallahu anhu, it's reported from Abu Hurairah, may Allah be pleased with him, qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, inna Allah ta'ala qala. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, من عاد, when, من عاد لي وليا فقد آذنته بالحرب. That uh, Allah says, whoever antagonizes or shows enmity towards my wali, towards my friend, right? Again, wilaya is the final cause of the human being according to um, the uh, philosophy of Islam, if you will, or the psychology of Islam. Uh, the one who antagonizes this friend of God, and I have announced to him war from me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declares war on the person uh, who uh, antagonizes the friends of God. It's interesting, you have a, you know, a plethora of, of Christian and, uh, Christians and atheists who are basically working full time on the internet, uh, trying to discredit and denounce the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Basically, it's, a, it's, a, it's an everyday verbal assault. You have YouTube channels with thousands upon thousands of, of prescribers. This is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or subscribers, this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, tells us about in the Quran. This is what he says is going to happen. This is just natural. That indeed, indeed, وَلَتَسْمَعُنَّ in Arabic is, is a lot of emphasis. Indeed, indeed, you will hear a lot from those who received the revelation before you, the Ahl al-Kitab and the Mushrikeen, which is interesting. The Quran doesn't necessarily affirm atheism. There were very, very, very few atheists in the, in the ancient world. There were a few, but the Quran does not entertain atheism. Everyone worships something. 
you're either from Ahl al-Kitab or you're a believer or you're a mushrik, right? So if you say, for example, the universe created itself, you're assigning to the universe a quality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're saying that the universe created itself, it's the khaliq of it, or it's the khaliq first of all. But then he said, no, the universe didn't create itself. The universe always existed. It has a sort of uh, um, uh, internal uh, pre-eternality. That's called al-qidm al-dhati, an essential pre-eternality. That's an attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are mushrikeen, basically. That's, that's called shirk, right? So you're going to hear a lot from people of different faiths, from people that are mushrikeen, that is going to grieve you. Adhan kathira. Right, a lot of sort of white noise. In tasbiru wa tattaqu fa inna dhalik min azmi al-umur. But if you show patience, great theological virtue, and you guard against evil, right? You guard yourself from this type of thing. Uh, then that will be the uh, determining factor of all affairs. Now, this doesn't mean that you can't ask questions to seek, you know, clarifications. Asking questions does not necess does not necessarily come from a place of doubt. Right? We have to remember that as well. Someone asking questions, even if they're difficult questions, uh, does not necessarily mean that this person is having issues with their iman or something like that. Um, that we should constantly seek to fortify uh, our iman. But anyway, cont continuing the hadith, this hadith Qudsi. وَمَا تَقَرَّبَ إِلَيَّ عَبْدِي بِشَيْءٍ أَحَبَّ إِلَيَّ مِمَّا إِفْتَرَضْتُهُ عَلَيْهِ That... My servant does not draw close unto me. Now, again, the speaker here is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the tongue of our master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. My servant does not draw close unto me with anything more beloved by me than his fara'id, right? His obligatory acts of worship. <clears throat> and he continues, And he continues to draw close unto me with his nawafil, with his uh, supererogatory acts of worship, right? So you have the five pillars of Islam, these are the fara'id, and then you have nawafil, you have extra. You have the, for example, the five daily Right, the mustahab days, the sunnah days. And you have sadaqah extra. You have the hajj, which is fard. You have umrah, which is extra. That leaves one pillar, the shahada. Shahada is essentially a form of dhikr. You say it on the tongue, as we said. You testify on the tongue. What is the nafila of the shahada? It is adhkar. It is dhikr, dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and additional as ala nabi. It is eulogies and benedictions upon the Prophet sallallahu Right? So the beloved of actions are fara'id. But then the, the hadith Qudsi says, draw near unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the extra credit, as you will. The nawafil hatta uhibba until I love him or her. The masculine is used here. Right? The, the, the female gender is encapsulated uh, in the masculine gender. It's understood to be there. Until I love him. Until this is God speaking, until I love him. And then he says, And when I love him, Kuntu Samahu Alati Yasmarubi. And when I love him, right? Faida Ahuhu, when I love him, I become his hearing by which he sees, and his butter and his sight by which he uh, sorry, his hearing by which he hears, and his sight by which he sees. Wa Yadahu Alati Yapatishu Biha. And his hand uh, by which uh, he strikes, and his foot, his rijil, alati yamshi biha, by which he walks. And if he were to ask anything from me, I shall surely give it to him. Right? If he were to ask anything from me, I shall surely give it to him. And, he continues, if he were to ask me for refuge, I should surely grant him it. Right? So this, uh, that hadith is in Bukhari, it's a sound hadith, hadith Qudsi. So going back to the hadith of Jibreel alayhi salam. Okay. And the 
Prophet وسلم, this is the description gives here a beautiful description. أَنَّكَ تَرَاهُ Prophet says, Al-Ihsan, spiritual action, affection of the soul, the relational aspect of the religion, the soul of the religion. It is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as though you see him, as if you see him. If you, uh, and if you don't see him, indeed he sees you, right? So, as if one is raptured in the beatific vision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just to give you a basic worldly example, if your boss comes into your office and says make a sale right now and he sits down in your office and he watches you how excellent of a sales call will you make right that's just your boss at work right who you might not even like very much as a person but when you worship <clears throat> worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if you can see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we cannot see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but then know Know in your very being that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees you. And then he says, فَأَخْبِرْنِي عَنِ السَّاعَةِ Right? So there's a fourth question. Sometimes we push the pause button on this hadith. You know, Islam, Iman, Ihsan, pause. But there's one more question. Uh, one more major question. There's actually five questions. But one more major question. What, uh, so tell me about a sa'a, the hour, i.e., the day of judgment. The hour, right? Uh, the word hour in English comes from the Greek hora. This is the same word that's used uh, for the day of judgment in the New Testament, for example, which is written in Greek. Um, so it begins with a omega, but there's rough breathing. So hora, that's why there's an H uh, when we say hour. So tell me about the hour. And he understood this question to mean, when is the hour? Right? Now the hour is close. The Prophet kahatain, and he put up these two fingers. Sallallahu alayhi alayhi wa sallam. The hour and myself are very close like this. So he is the eschatological prophet. He is the first of the major signs of the hour. His coming is the first major sign of a sa'a. Right? When you look at the entire history of humanity. It's very, very close. So the Prophet Sallallahu answer is, مَنْ مَسْؤُولُ عَنْهَا بِأَعْلَمَ مِنَ السَّائِلِ The mas'ul, the one who is being asked the question, right, the one who is being questioned, knows no more than the questioner, the, sa the sa'il, meaning Jibreel alayhi salam. Nobody knows the exact time of the sa'a. Right? This is a secret that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept for himself. Right? Uh, in the Quran, it says, they ask you concerning the sa'a. When will it be established? قُلْ إِنَّمَا عِلْمُهَا عِنْدَ رَبِّي Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the Prophet sallallahu to say, the knowledge of the sa'a is only with my Lord. The knowledge of the sa'a is only with my Lord. So nobody knows. Nobody knows when it is. In fact, in the New Testament, you have this saying that is attributed to Isa alayhi salam in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24, verse 36, when he says, Of that day, right? Of that day knoweth no man, not the angels, not even the Son, but only the Father. Now, before we continue, we have to understand here that these terms, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, these are Hebraisms. You actually find these terms, these sort of ingredients of the Trinity, the ingredients of the Trinity, right? Not the doctrine of the Trinity. The ingredients and in, in these terms, the nomenclature of Trinitarian Christianity is found in the Old Testament, but they have different meanings. So what the early Christians did is they took these terms, they appropriated them and redefined them through a Trinitarian lens. So in the Old Testament, in Jewish texts, even at the time of Isa alayhi salam, this is, this is a, a Jewish prophet in a Jewish environment, right? When Jews called uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the father, what that meant was ab, uh, sorry, what that meant was rab. So ab, father, means rab, 
right? Isaiah chapter 64, 16. Atta Adonai Avinu, you are the Lord our Father. This is totally majaz. This is figurative language, right? It's figurative. No one means this. No Jewish prophet, Isaiah did not mean that in a literal sense, that God is a literal father, or God is my literal father, or that God is the literal father of anyone. And when I say literal father, I not only mean in the literal physical sense, but I mean any, that anyone shares a nature with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anyone shares divine quality with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nobody does. And we'll get into some of this uh, theology. And then the word son, right? You find this in the Old Testament. Israel is my son, even my firstborn. In the Psalms, God says to David, you are my son, this day I have begotten you. What does that mean? What does it mean to, to be a uh, uh, ben Adonai, ben Elohim, right? Uh, Ibn Allah, what, is, what does that mean in a Jewish context? It simply means abd. It means slave or servant, right? And it's a great maqam to be a servant of Allah. It's a great station to be the servant of Allah. It's not like when we, you know, we use these terms slave. People think of, you know, slave in the American context, like chattel slavery. That's what it is, right? Because in that type of relationship, the slave is... Uh, dehumanized, humiliated, uh, and the only one that benefits is the slave master. But in the relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the slave is honored and he benefits. The slave benefits. We cannot benefit Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala one iota. There's nothing that we can do that can possibly benefit him. We take all the benefit. So it's a great maqam to be the abd par excellence. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa took great pride in the sense that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala frequently refers to him in the Quran as his abd. فَأَوْحَى إِلَىٰ عَبْدِهِ مَا أَوْحَى Right? <clears throat> so, son, in a Jewish context, son means abd, means servant. Evid Adonai, right? And, uh, and father, in a Jewish context, means rab. Right? So we have to keep that uh, in mind. So what does it mean for Jesus to be the son? Right, because in the New Testament he refers to himself uh, more often than not as the Son of Man, um, and there's different ways of interpreting that. It seems to be a a way of stressing his humanity, or just a way of saying prophet, or just human being. Uh, but sometimes the Son. Now this could be obviously uh, there could be um, uh, um, alterations that the text has suffered. But again, keeping things in a Jewish context, if he's the Son, right? So. First of all, he says we're all children of God, right? Sermon on the Mount in, in, in Matthew chapter 5, also in the, uh, the book of Luke. In the Aramaic, he says, Avunda vashmayo, our Father who art in heaven. They ask him, how do we pray? He says, pray like this, Avunda vashmayo, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be, hallowed be thy name, right? Our Father, not just his Father, all of us. And again, ab means rab. So I would actually translate that. The meaning of that is Rabbana, Rabbana, O oh our Lord. That's what it means, right? So what does it mean then for Jesus to be the Son or, you know, monogenes huias, you know, the one-of-a-kind Son? What does that mean? Well, Christians take that to mean that he's the second person of a triune Godhead. But it simply means that he's the Messiah, right? Isa, alayhi salam, has this unique title. He's a unique abd. And the Prophet Sallallahu is also a unique abd. And Musa Alayhi Salam is a unique abd. Right? Unique abd. Unique slave of God. So anyway, going back to this idea of the sa'a, I have to explain this sort of before we get into this. So Matthew 24, 36, he says, um, Of that day knoweth no man. Right? Not the angels. Ude hahuias in the Greek. Not even the son. Not even the Messiah. Not even this unique servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning himself, but only the Father, only the Rabb, only the Rabb knows this, the, this, the Sa'a, the day he calls it, Al-Yawm, Yawm Azim. So Isa alayhi salam here, according to a Christian text, which is a canonical text, authoritative text, the Gospel of Matthew, the most, uh, the most popular gospel in all of antiquity, admits he doesn't know. Now what's really interesting is, later scribes, they removed that, that statement, ude hahuias, from manuscripts of Matthew's gospel. 
Later Greek manuscripts, they omit that. So Jesus says, of that day knoweth no man, not the angels in heaven, but only the Father. Which still doesn't help, really, because the Son is not the Father. You can't say that. The Father is the same person as the Son. That's a violation of Trinitarian theology. But these scribes, whenever they were, probably 2nd and 3rd century, they found it very troubling that Jesus, who's supposed to be God, doesn't know something because ilm mutlaq, right? It's a very important concept. God has these sort of omni-attributes, right? He's omniscient. He knows everything. He's all-knowing, right? This is called a qualitative attribute of God. God has certain attributes um, that qualify him as being deity. One of them is omniscience. Sifatul ma'ani, we call them in Arabic, right? Ilm mutlaq, perfect knowledge. Does it increase? Does it decrease? It's perfect. So the fact that Isa alayhi salam, according to this Christian text, whether it's authentic or not, Allahu alam, it doesn't really make a difference to us, right? Um, whether it's authentic or not. But according to this text, he admits that he doesn't know something. And if he's God, he's supposed to know everything. <clears throat> of course, in Numbers 23, 19, uh, this is in the Torah or the modern day Torah. Numbers 23, 19, uh, it says, Lo God is not a man, right? That he should lie. Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man is just three words. I always have my students memorize it. Lo ish el, God is not a man. Lo ish el, not a man is God. That he should lie is the rest of that statement. So Christians, how do Christians deal with this statement? God is not a man that he should lie. They say, yeah, God is not a man that he should lie. In other words, God can become a man, and he did become a man. Uh, he became Jesus, peace be upon him, uh, and Jesus never lied about that. Right? But that's not the actual meaning of that verse in Hebrew. And this is something that rabbinical authorities point out in their debates with Christians. This goes all the way back to like the third century. Rabbi Abahu of Caesarea, who used to debate Christian apologists, he said, that's not the meaning of it. The meaning is, whoever claims, any man who claims to be God, he's a liar. Right? So that's the meaning of it. God is not a man that he should lie. Any man, any human being who claims to be God is a liar. And that's not the only place. You have Hosea chapter 11, verse 9. Ki anuchi el vilo ish. Indeed, I am God and not a man. They are two mutually exclusive entities. Right? So the Prophet he's mal mas'ulu anha bi a'lama min as The one who is being questioned knows no more than the questioner. And he continues. So now we have uh, yet another question. So Islam, Iman, right? Ihsan, Asa'a. Now a fifth question, a clarifying question, number five. Maybe just, you know, 4, 4A, question 4A. فَأَخْبِرْنِي عَنْ أَمَارَاتِهَا So tell me about, okay, you don't know when is the Sa'a, but tell me its signs and portents, right? So why is this important? Because we need to recognize the signs of our times, right? And be able to guard or protect ourselves against evil. That's why there's a very fairly large corpus of what's known as eschatological literature in our tradition. The Prophet ﷺ, he spoke a lot about the portents of the Sa'a and the fitan, the trials and tribulations that are going to manifest towards the end of time. Because the Prophet ﷺ, he's not just a Bashir. He's, he's not just a, a bearer of glad tidings. Ya ayyuhan nabiyu, inna arsalnaka shahidan wa mubashiran wa nadira. Shahidan wa mubashir. He gives the bushra. Wa nadira. And a warner. He's here to warn us about things. Wa da'iyan ilallahi bi idnih wa sirajan munira. So the Prophet ﷺ, he gives us warning. This is part of his vocation as a prophet. So what does the Prophet ﷺ, what does he say? He says, Antalida al-amatu rabbataha. Ajib statement. He says that the uh, slave girl or the low-born, base-born girl will give birth to her mistress. Mistress means female master. 
right? That a girl will give birth to her mistress or master. So the ulama, they have difference of opinion about this, but generally they say that the meaning of this is that towards the sa'a, there's going to be sort of a flood of what's known as filial recalcitrance, the opposite, the opposite of virul walidain, the opposite of filial piety, which is so important, and everything starts at home. All of uh, Confucius's philosophy begins with virul walidain, right? You know, so this bolsters or buttresses our case for Luqman al-Hakim as being Look, uh, as being Confucius, because he's giving advice to him. Ya bunaya, ya, ya bunaya, la tushrik billah, inna shirk la dhulmun adim. Ya bunaya. Right? He's teaching his, chil his son, his children. So filial recalcitrance. So you have this idea now, this kind of postmodern philosophy that's floating around in colleges and universities, uh, in society in general, this idea of radical, absolute egalitarianism in the society, which has never worked. History has shown it's never worked. Uh, hierarchical structures are very important to society. Those work, and they're, they're tried and they're tested. That there's always going to be, when you can't equalize people, it's just not going to happen. People have different abilities. People are born into different types of uh, uh, class and status and wealth. There's always going to be a khas and an am. There's always going to be you know, a, a noble class or the, the nobility, the nobles, if you will, influential, wealthy, and, there, and there's going to be the, the am, the laity or the commoners. That's how it works. Hierarchies work. They work in the workplace. They work in, in educational institutions. And they work in the family. This, the, the, the study that I cite oftentimes, uh, Charles University in Prague, where the researchers dis discovered that that um, households where one spouse is dominant over the other, those households tend to be happier and have more children. Now, what do I mean by dominant? I don't mean that one spouse is oppressing the other one. I mean there's a clear sort of social hierarchy within the family, a chain of command, where the person at the top, they are, uh, they're magnanimous in the way that they treat their family, but the buck, as it were, stops at that person. They have the sort of final say within the household. And this, this study found that 72% of those happy families were male-dominated. So there's a reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, al-rijalu qawwamuna ala nisa You know, the Quran is not trying to be misogynistic and, uh, and you know, um, because that's, you know, this, this whole, a whole idea of patriarchy and we need to smash it and, and build up. A, I mean, good luck with that. These things are not going to work. Right. Um, so this idea of, of, you know, children now ruling their parents. Right. Um, I just saw a thing on the news the other day. There's a show on Netflix. I think it's called the Babysitter's Club or something like that, where you have this you know, eight year old uh, boy who's in the hospital, biological boy. And you have these doctors that are treating this patient as, as a boy. And then one of one of his friends or someone, a girl, comes in and says, can I talk to you, two doctors outside? And this girl who's like 10 years old or something, the friend of this boy who's sick, begins to just lecture these, these grown adult physicians. I don't care what your chart says. Look at her. It's a girl. You know, treat her like a girl. You're being violent or something. You're, you're creating an unsafe space for this girl. It's actually a girl. So now we just kind of live in make-believe land. And the doctors are sitting there, doctors, physicians, in their 50s, listening to this 10-year-old girl lecture them, oh, okay, you're right, you're right. Very, very strange. <clears throat> okay, so, and then he says, وَأَن تَرَى الْحُفَاتَ الْعُرَاتَ الْعَالَى رِيَعَ الشَّاءِ يَتَتَوَّلُونَ فِي الْبُنْيَانِ So that's the first one he says, the Prophet ﷺ, he says, the, the slave girl will, will give birth to her master. And then he says something interesting. You will see the barefooted, naked, destitute herdsmen competing uh, in the construction of lofty buildings. Right? So why these two signs? Why these two portents? So does the scholars say that? Well, one will come very quickly and one will come later. Or one will come within the family and one will manifest 
uh, in the society. The, the barefoot, naked, destitute shepherds, herdsmen, competing in the construction of lofty buildings, right? So in other words, hubba dunya, love of the world, the New Testament, uh, love, uh, love of mammon, right? That's how Isa, Islam, at least according to the New Testament, puts it. You know, uh, the, the hadith says, hubba dunya, love of the world, ra'su kulli khati'a, is the head of every type of sin, love of the world, right? So this idea of, you know, shepherds, naked, barefoot, now competing in lofty buildings, it means that hubba dunya can take root even in the most unlikely of places. In the most unlikely of places, simple shepherds, Bedouins living in the desert in tents are now fully engrossed in love of mammon, as it were, love of the world, right? There's a surah of the Quran uh, that, uh, that we, uh, we know very well, but we seldom contemplate. Surah 102, at takathur What does at takathur mean? It comes from kathir. It's form six verb, which denotes this kind of reciprocal action. So you have this sort of mutual competition or rivalry, right? For stuff, for kathra, for a lot of stuff. al hakumut takathur the Quran says. That this, this mutual competition or consumerism amongst yourselves deludes you or distracts you, right? It distracts you. Until you visit the graves, right? And the meaning is either until you go into your grave, and that's really when you wake up. Because Sayyidina Ali said, human beings are asleep, and when they die, they wake up. That's when the yaqeen. ثُمَّ كَلَّ سَوْفَ تَعَلَمُونَ ثُمَّ كَلَّ سَوْفَ تَعَلَمُونَ لَوْ تَعَلَمُونَ لَوْ تَعَلَمُونَ عِلْمَ الْيَقِينَ لَتَرَوُنَّ الْجَحِيمَ Or it means that you should go to the graveyard. When you actually go visit a graveyard, that's when people start putting things in perspective. Right? That's why we should go to funerals. Somebody dies in your community and there's a janazah prayer. Go to the graveyard. Go look at the burial. Right? And this, you know, Takathur, this idea of, of, of competition, you know, you have a perfectly good phone, you know, you, you got to buy another phone because your, your cousin has a, a, the latest iPhone. Your phone is perfectly good, but no, you have to compete with this person. And that's just, in, you know, in one little gadget. For people like this, they spend their entire lives just takathur. Very interesting. So the Prophet wasallam, his two portents that he gives us, Right? He tells us basically, number one, there's going to be a major breakdown of social structures. Right? We're going to enter into a type of social chaos. And then we're going to, uh, there's going to be a sort of dominance of materialism. People will fall into total materialism. Right? And another thing he said, it's not mentioned in the hadith here, in the hadith of Jibreel, but the Prophet ﷺ, he said that there are other signs, other portents of the Sa'a, the coming of the Antichrist is one of them. If you look at Isa alayhi salam, if you look at our Christology, Isa alayhi salam, according to the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, his message is, is uh, ukhrawi, it's, it's otherworldly, right? He's talking about mot, about death, he's talking about akhira, he's talking about purifying the self, you know, he says, the dunya is like a bridge, hurry up and cross over it. He says, the world is like a man who's at sea, uh, trapped on a, on, a, on a boat, completely lost at sea. He starts taking handful after handful of seawater into his mouth, which is representative, symbolical for the dunya. The more he drinks, the more thirstier he gets, and then it kills him. Right? He says, the world is like a haggard old prostitute who sticks her hand out from behind a wall, which is all, you know, bejeweled with rings and, and, uh, and nail polish and, and bangles and wave and over to her. So the men, go, they, they go and they look around the corner and then she grabs them and slaughters them. That's the nature of the dunya. Right, so the Antichrist then, the uh, Messiah at Dajjal, his message is the, is the polar opposite of Isa alayhi salam. 
is that salvation is through materialism. This is all there is, so just enjoy your life, right? And this is, you know, you know the, the barefooted, naked, destitute herdsmen competing uh, in the construction of lofty buildings. That's how the Prophet Wasallam described uh, this, um, this phenomenon in a very dramatic sort of way of putting it. And then he says, ثُمَّ إِنْ تَلَقَى فَلَبِثْتُ مَلِيًّا Sayyidina Umar, he says, then this man left and I stayed for a while and the Prophet ﷺ, he came to me and said, Ya Umar, at-tadri man is sail Do you realize who the questioner was? And Sayyidina Umar, he says, Allahu rasuluhu a'lam. Allah and his messenger know best. Fa'innahu Jibreel. Indeed, he was Jibreel alayhi salam. Yes. The age of Horus. Indeed. This is what uh, Crowley says in the Liber Leges. Alistair Crowley, one of these sort of hidden figures that have so much, that has um, influenced American or Western society, now world, the world, in such an incredible way. The founder of the modern religion of Thelema, which is a type of Satanism, right? He wrote this book called the Liber Leges, which he claimed was dictated to him by a shaitan, by a, a demon named Awas, which is interesting, sounds like waswas. And in that book he says, um, you know, Crowley says that we're going to enter into the age of Horus, the age of the child, right? The dominance of the child. In other words, an, an age of, of, of a lack of discipline, an age of, of just, just following the hawa, right? Following the nafs. Uh, an age that there, where it's unreasonable because the, the, the purpose of the aqal, aqal means to bind something. Ya'qil means to, like the, to the hobble a camel. Ya'qilha, the Prophet ﷺ said about the camel running around outside the masjid. So whose camel is that? He, the Bedouin said, that's my camel. Atawakkalu ala Allah. I've trusted Allah. He said, tie her down. Right? The intellect is supposed to tie down and control the nafs, the hawa, the caprice. This goes all the way back to Plato. We've mentioned this before. The rational soul has to, has to be in the driver's seat to, to, to keep the appetitive soul and the striving soul in check. But it's the age of Horus. <clears throat> I'm sorry if there's problems with the audio. Uh, I'm the only one here today. Um, inshallah, we can work that out. Um, God incarnate is an Aryan and Greco-Roman concept. Well, <clears throat> Arianism is, is um, it's hard to, un it's hard to uh, pin down Aryan Christology. It's, God incarnate is certainly a Trinitarian belief. That's Orthodox Christianity, right? Um, Incarnatus est, it says in the Nicene Creed. It says in the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed that God came down and assumed flesh. That's what that means, incarnation. What did Arius actually believe? Um, most of his writings are lost, with the exception of one. Yeah. Most of our information about Arius comes from his opponents, which you can't really trust. Can you really trust your opponents to reproduce? Even according to Termo Tum, a Christian theologian who wrote the book, um, it's a very good book, if I can think of the title, uh, classic, Classical Trinitarian Theology. Right? He says in that book, Tomb, T-O-O-M, he says that it's, it's known that many of the early church fathers, they would, um, they would uh, belie Arius, they would, they would misquote him, they would quote him out of context. Uh, but something that seems to be from Arius, because it's in the Nicene Creed, is the belief that Isa alayhi salam, that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, that uh, the, the Son of God, he, and he used that term, but not in a Trinitarian sense, that the Son of God, there was a time when the Son did not exist, right? That was sort of the, the, the credo of the, of the Arians, at least according to the Nicene Creed. In Greek, ein pate hate uk ein, there was a time when he was not, there was a time when he, the Son of God, was not. 
and Arius referred to Christ as the Kitisma creation. The Son is created. He used the term, right? Um, so that's sort of one way of looking at Arianism. The other way of looking at it is, well, okay, that might have been true, but um, did Arius somehow still um, give the Son some sort of semi-divine or demigod uh, status? Um, to the, I mean, that's certainly how some of the early church fathers portray him, that the early church fathers, ironically, uh, are defending monotheism in the face of what they believe is a type of bi-theism, which is being espoused by the Arians. Right? So Trinitarian monotheism for the early church fathers is a real type of monotheism, whereas what Arius was saying is that Arius is trying to propose that there are actually two gods, the Father and the Son. I think that's probably a misrepresentation of Arianism. I think Arius believed, um, based on <clears throat> what uh, occurs to me as far as my research, that Arius believed that the Son was, was created at some point, that katisma teleon, he calls him, the best of creation, right? That was, that was Arius. Okay. <clears throat> so anyway, he says, that was Gabriel. He came to you to teach you your religion. And that's the end of the hadith, right? Now, I only have a few minutes left. I want to just uh, read a few statements from the beautiful creed, a very ecumenical, popular creed of Imam Abu Ja'far at tahawi um, the, the world-famous creed, which is derived from the Qur'an, the mutawatir, the multiply attested hadith of our master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and the ijma, uh, the, the consensus of the first three generations, the Salaf of the Muslim Ummah. Just read very quickly here. He says, so number one, and of course, uh, creed, the word creed comes from the Latin credo, which means I believe, right? Uh, so cr uh, creed in Arabic is aqida, which is related to the Hebrew word aqida, right? The binding of Isaac, Genesis 22, right? to bind something, that's what the, the root is, wahlul uqaddatam mil lisani, right? Release the sort of t knot from my tongue, which is the prayer of Musa alayhi salam. So these are, these are beliefs that are binding upon us. It's just a, li a list of our beliefs. This is the aim of the creedal theologian, right? The aim of the creedal theologian is simply to articulate our basic beliefs, just a list of our beliefs. And it's different than ilmul kalam, right? Ilmul kalam, or dialectical theology, or possibly a better translation. I don't like speculative theology, but discursive theology. The aim of the discursive theologian, the mutakallim, is to reconcile our belief, our sacred texts, with reason, right? So it's not just, you know, we believe in God and this is who God is. It's, you know, um, is belief in God reasonable? Is belief in revelation reasonable? Is belief in angels reasonable? Right. So here Imam Tahawi, he's assumed the role of a of a, a creedal theologian. Right. So he's not going to get into a lot of discussion, a lot of um, dialectics, if you will. So he begins by saying, "Inna Allah wahidun la sharika la." God is one, and He has no partner. And some of the ulama say here that wahid here denotes a sort of internal oneness of God. That he's one quote-unquote person. Using the person as an entity which has a personality. One entity, right? Persona or hypostasis in, in Greek. Uh, in other words, the sort of Godhead in Islam is a simple unity. Rigidly one. Unitarian monotheism. In Christianity... Um, when it comes to the essence, attributes, and actions of God. So in our tradition, no one shares in the essence and attributes and actions of God. No one has the essence, attributes, or actions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is rigidly one, in internal oneness. He is wahid. In Christianity, three hypostases, three persons, 
share in the essence, the attributes, and actions of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَلَا تَقُولُوا ثَلَاثَةً Don't say three. Thalatha doesn't mean trinity. It could mean trinity. But it means three. Don't say three. Whether it's three gods, right? In other words, like a sort of uh, Neoplatonic or Middle Platonic um, hierarchy of being, where there's, it's really more henotheistic, where there's one major god, but then there's two sort of minor gods that are, that are effects of the major god or the one, right? So the godhead is sort of three distinct gods that have similar essence. Don't say that. Don't say one essence and three persons. So this verse, the way that it's worded is, is, is incredible because not only is it denouncing Trinitarian monotheism, but also these types of middle platonic uh, henotheistic tritheism, all of these types of things, because that was also very popular. This predates Christianity, middle platonic philosophers. They talked about the one, they talked about the, um, you know, who, who, who caused from his being the logos, they use that term, or the noose, the word, and, and through self-intellection, this kind of emanation, and then you have another emanation from the, from the logos, from the noose, that created this, the, the, what they call the uh, psuche, the psyche, the spirit, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, right? Christianity is heavily influenced by Middle and, and, and Neoplatonism to the point where in the Gospel of John, you see that word, NRK ain't halakas. In the beginning was the logos, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Again, we, so what we have with Christianity, you have an appropriation of Jewish terminology redefined through a Trinitarian lens. You also have an appropriation of Hellenistic philosophy and theology um, uh, redefined uh, through a Trinitarian lens. Right? So with the New Testament books, especially John, you have sort of one hand on Plato and Aristotle and the other hand on the Tanakh, the Old Testament. And it's really sort of marrying the two together. This is why Imam al-Ghazali warns us in the Tahafat al falasifa that it's very, very dangerous to get into these, to get into Hellenistic metaphysics. He's not an anti-scholastic. Imam al-Ghazali says in that text, he says, I'm not against, you know, um, uh, you know, you know the, the, the hard sciences, the natural science. That has nothing to do with your religion. Right? He says if, if a, if a uh, scientist comes up to you and says you can predict uh, the, the eclipse of the moon or something, that's fine. Don't argue with him. But steer clear of Hellenistic metaphysics because look what it did to Christianity. And look what it did to Judaism as well. Philo of Alexandria, highly influenced, middle platonic philosopher who talks about a deuteros theos, a second god that he calls the logos. Right? He lived in Egypt and Alexandria. That's probably where the Gospel of John was written as well. Anyways, I'm out of time. Inna Allah wahidun la sharika lah. That's the essence of the theology. Qul huwa Allahu ahad, Allahu samad, lam yalid wa lam yulad, wa lam yakun lahu kufuan ahad. So next week, inshallah ta'ala, we'll continue and we'll go into Judaism. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Muhammadin wa la alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Wa alhamdulillahi wa bil alameen. Wa salam alaykum. ورحمة الله وبركاته